So when, when the Sandy Hook families uh, came to see us, it was about nine years ago, and it was in the aftermath of shattering loss, and they were stunned, and they didn't know what to do or where to go. Um, but they did know that they wanted to do one thing. They had the energy and drive and motivation to do one thing. And that was to do whatever they could so that other families, whether they are in a suburb or a township or a city, would not have to go through the kind of pain and loss that they had. That was an enormous and very solemn position to be in, to be asked by these families. It was an obligation, but it was also an enormous privilege. And my answer was, I don't know. Now, I didn't know anything about guns or gun law. I didn't even heard of this immunity. But I knew enough to never tell a, pro- tell a client, oh, yeah, we got this, no problem. <laughs> uh, and I also thought, wow, this is, this is going to be a, an enormous effort. And then I thought, how can we not try? And actually, a lot of this was through the help of my dad, who, who passed away during this time, because he was always about that. Um, we knew we had to start somewhere in terms of looking. Oh, I, to, to answer the question about what they could do, first we had, to dis, we, had to, we had to figure out where to start. Where do you start? We knew it was partly about learning about the issues and uh, doing our homework about the facts of the case. Because I didn't know there was an immunity law, I figured it was just general tort law, which we do every day, and that we could apply our collective creativity to figure out a way. I didn't know there were extra protections for this particular industry. So we had to do our homework on the facts, and we had to get to know the families, I thought. So, uh, and I... Would, I will admit that I always, when, I, when I saw the weapon, and it is a weapon, it's not a firearm, it's not a modern sporting rifle, it's not a family Swiss army knife, it's a combat weapon. It's a combat weapon. And when I saw it, I didn't know it was a combat weapon at the time. I just thought, what is that thing? I've never seen anything like it. So I figured I better do my homework and learn about it. We all did. And this is before we filed a lawsuit, of course, because you can't file a lawsuit unless you are confident that you have a plausible, at least a plausible case. That is our obligation as officers of the court. So here's what you need to know about the AR-15 Combat rifle. Can we go first? I, we had a uh, document that is actually publicly available, and of course, I knew this was going to happen <laughs> because it always does. Um, but we, but we had it. We had a a a document that really answered the question about what this is and what it isn't. And I'm showing you the document, because if anybody tries to tell you the commercial AR-15 is not much more dangerous than a toaster or any other weapon even, or firearm, you should, take, you should have this at your disposal, because this is the most independent objective and chilling evidence of what an AR-15 is. Defense, the Department of Defense document. Oh, yeah. um, so the Department of Defense uh, did a, you know, 
the, the, the goal of the military is to, is to protect us, right? It's to preserve our freedoms abroad in battlefields and streets and jungles so that we can enjoy them, all of us can enjoy them. People who love guns and people who hate guns and everybody in between can enjoy those freedoms here at home and can enjoy our way of life. And it, we are so fortunate to have a military that will fight and even die to protect those freedoms. And when it came to the military looking for the best weapon, the most lethal weapon, the most destructive weapon, and the weapon that could provide our soldiers should they be forced to shoot and kill the enemies of our country and of our freedom, they chose the AR-15. They chose it. The greatest military in the world, which could have had any weapon, chose the AR-15. And they didn't only ch choose it, because the military is not going to invest millions of dollars into anybody who designs a weapon. The, the weapon is a, just a feat of technology uh, coming out of the Armalite company. It's not, and, and it's a feat of technology. And there was a lot of competition here. But the military is not going to just go with it and give all the, so our soldiers who are fighting to preserve our freedoms here any old weapon. So they tested it. They field tested it. And they tested it against notorious weapons, including the Thompson submachine gun, the Tommy gun, a weapon so dangerous that in 1934 was effectively outlawed. And you know who led the charge in that outlaw? The NRA. The NRA. And it was outlawed because gangsters like Pretty Boy Floyd and Al Capone were committing massacres in the streets. So everybody got together, even the gun industry. But they turned to the NRA to help ban, essentially, they, the idea was they wanted to ban the weapon, but they were worried they couldn't because of certain legal interpretations. So what they did is they, that wasn't placa. <laughs> but what they did was they, they just taxed it to, into oblivion. So they made it absolutely unaffordable. And eventually it was banned. Uh, essentially, the, the fully automatic weapons were banned. But the AR-15 is so lethal and deadly that it actually absolutely crushed the, comp the, the Tommy gun in these, te in these field tests in, in v essentially in, in Vietnam. That is how lethal it is. And the mainstay of the AR-15 is semi-automatic fire. There have been different versions that allow you to switch, switch to automatic fire fully, then to something called burst fire, which allows for three. Uh, five, uh, rounds at a time to be discharged with one pull of the trigger. But, but in the field of battle, when our soldiers are laying their lives on the line, semi-automatic fire is almost universally preferred. And while they, they've gotten rid of somewhat, some, there's, there's, they've, they've switched from fully automatic to burst fire, that's, that, it's still the mainstay is semi-automatic fire. So do not let anybody say, well, it's not a military weapon because it doesn't have a selector switch. It would be a least, it would be less lethal a weapon probably if it were fully automatic and not semi-automatic. All right, so I've made my point. Uh, the, I'm not, I'm not, this is a very detailed report. You can see it. You should, you should, this is a, I thought this was an anchoring, this enlightened, like taught me about what the weapon was by the most independent, most reliable, and most objective source our Department of Defense. And here it is being used, uh, it's an M, probably an M4, you see that's the AR-15 uh, platform. That's recently in Afghanistan probably, I'm not, I'm not, couldn't swear to it, but uh, you know, we, it was from the jungles of, of, of Iraq to the streets of Fallujah, uh, and right now, guess what? There are Ukrainian soldiers bunkered down waiting for the world's second most powerful nation and they are armed with AR-15s, Ukrainian version. All right. Now, we also knew we had to learn about the families, a little bit about the families. Um, and so the, and, and, and there are some freedoms. Why, why, why do people lay it on, on the line? Why do, why, because there's, there are freedoms worth fighting for, for and protecting, even if it, they're life-threatening. Uh, situations on battlefields abroad. So let's take, a, I want to take a, just a glimpse to the, the families, not just that, these families who I love, 
but the people I never knew. And because they deserve to stand here and say, you know what? You know what? I got robbed. I got robbed. So let's go to uh, just this. <laughs> Where's this? this is... Uh, um, this is uh, Vicky Soto, okay? Obviously, her most elegant picture. Uh, Vicky was the, the oldest sister of, of Jillian and, and Carly and Matthew. And she was, uh, you can see why a first grader might uh, kind of want to be in her good graces and <laughs> enjoy going to school. And, and on December 14, 2012, Vicky was all holiday spirit. Uh, she was, uh, in fact, she, she was standing in, her, in the kitchen of their, of their home where they all shared, right? When Ma, and Donna, her mom's a nurse, and, and Vicky, uh, Vicky was already fully dressed with an outfit that she thought the kids would love, and that included boots with, with relatively, I don't know if they're high heels, two, they always explain to me as two-inch heels, but what Vicky did, because Carly, her, little, her younger sister, was in high school and sleeping in the basement, what Vicky did was she made sure when she came down at 6 a.m. to Stomp on to stomp on the on the floor because she knew it would shatter you know uh, Carly awake and that was uh, very pleasing to Vicky um, and there she was in, in in the pitch black she lived in Stratford so she had a long drive to the school but she was uh, always uh, uh, getting up in the dark and coming home in the dark and she was really really excited because she, the kids were making gingerbread cookies in in the in her classroom. Very excited. This was all Vicky, and she had she had she had set it up like a perfect. Everybody had a schedule to come in because she didn't want all the kids and all the parents in the same time uh, making gingerbread cookies. Uh, and if that and and, uh, and that was Vicky, and you know we know because of what was blasting in the car that was picked up later, that all the way from Stratford um, to Sandy Hook, Vicky was was blasting Michael Bublé's uh, Christmas carols. Christmas Carol. I never heard him, but they, apparently it was pretty loud. Um, so she was. That was what life. That's just a snapshot of what life looked like for one person, Vicky Soto. This is Lauren, Lauren Rousseau. Lauren was sort of on her way. She was a she was a hard worker, a hustler, somebody who would not uh, who did not who didn't uh, spend a lot of idle time sitting around and complaining about things. Uh, she was a hard worker trying to get through life uh, early on, and she was trying to, uh, her, to realize her, 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 I say trying to get through life. Her whole life was ahead of her. I don't mean it's like she was looking back. She, she, was, she, was, uh, she was trying to find, find a job as a teacher because that was her lifelong dream, and she was also working at Starbucks at the same time. So uh, on, this, on this day, she was called in as a substitute, which of course was great, because the teacher, the normal teacher that would have been there that Friday had an appointment for an ultrasound uh, for who was pregnant. And so Vicky, uh, sorry, sorry, so Lauren said, oh, I'll take that. And she was super uh, excited because that night she was going to see The Hobbit with her boyfriend. And they had even made Hobbit cookies the night before. You know, that's what, that's what was going on in, in Lauren's life. This is Rachel, Rachel Devino. Rachel was the forever student, right? Did she ever not go? To, was she ever going to stop going to school? Uh, Rachel uh, was a uh, had just finished two days before her uh, ABA, which is an Applied Behavioral Analysis Certificate, and she was uh, she was laying the foundation to ultimately get her doctorate. And she was uh, she was so excited about her the prospects of her. Um, future career. And she did something really I haven't heard of. I don't think I ever heard of anybody doing this. I've read about them. But she, on, on two days before, on, on the Wednesday before the, the, the 14th, she made a time capsule. And in the time capsule, and she did it with a friend, she wrote the following. It is my dream that you know my name as a leader in behavioral analysis for children and adults with autism. However, I will be thrilled if I make a few people have an easier, more enjoyable life. And that's what the world looked like to Rachel on that morning. And this is Mary. Bill, are you here? 
who Bill's uh, wife of uh, a long time. I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill was standing in a, in a, this is Bill was standing in a, at a Christmas party in uh, upstate New York uh, about in the 76, I think, 1976, and he was talking to a friend named John, and Bill, uh, all of a sudden, this gorgeous woman walked in, and both young, and, and Bill was very distracted by what John had, was talking about, and he, he, he said, who is that? You know her? And, he, and John turned around and goes, oh, yeah, that's Mary Green. Forget about it. You got no chance. <laughs> And, the, and there, was, there was Bill, 36 years and three days later, standing with his wife, Mary Sherlock, on his way to work, giving her a hug and a kiss. And Mary, by that time, had become a school psychologist. Oh, and then he left for work. That, that's what normal, everyday thing. And they were going to see each other anyway because she was taking a half day and they were going to go up to Essex to visit some friends. And anyway, uh, Mary was a school psychologist and, uh, she, and, and she, she just... It was all about the kids for her. And during the, her 18-year career, she had seen kids with all kinds of problems, developmental delays, you know, uh, getting bullied, all the types of things that happened in elementary school, and she loved it. Uh, and, then she, and she was getting herself ready, I, I think that's been explained to me, to get into that next phase of her life, which was to, to uh, become a grandmother. They had two daughters, and uh, she was sort of trying not to pressure them, you know, but waiting, biding her time. She was going to work... Another year at Sandy Hook, uh, unless one of her daughters had a, unless she had a granddaughter, whichever came first, she would then, she would, she would probably have uh, left Sandy Hook earlier so that she could jump into her role as a grandmother. And uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, she lost that opportunity. And they, they but Bill didn't. He so do granddaughters. Um, this is Jesse Lewis. Jesse Lewis was, uh, Jesse Lewis, I think of him as kind of a renaissance man. He doesn't look, maybe he doesn't look at in this picture. He looks like a, somebody you wouldn't want to uh, be the goalie against at that age. But, but Jesse Lewis was a painter. <laughs> Jesse Lewis was a fisherman. Jesse Lewis was an athlete. He loved animals. He helped his dad build Neil uh, uh, with repairs of trucks. And uh, the night before, on the Thursday, but night before the 14th, Jesse Lewis and his dad went to pick out Christmas ornaments so that he could buy an ornament for his favorite teacher, Mrs. Soto. Uh, and also, uh, then they went to Walmart where Jesse pointed to all of the toys that he wanted. And uh, they were Nerf guns, they were toy soldiers, everything military. Jesse loved the military and he loved playing soldier. And the next day, it was a great day, because Fridays always were with, between Jesse and Neil, because they always went to, this, to a diner, and Jesse could always get his sausage and eggs. And, uh, and it was his favorite breakfast, just to give the, the it was the Misty Vale Diner. This is Dylan. Uh, Dylan, uh, the morning uh, of 12, 14, 12, was, started out with a major breakthrough for Dylan. And his mom, uh, uh, Nicole, uh, and 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 uh, Dylan Dylan lived uh, with his, his with Nicole and, and his dad Ian and his uh, old and his older uh, brother Jake, uh, and Dylan was a child with autism. And one of the things that his parents had been struggling with with him on was his diet, which let's just say it was not a varied diet. Uh, and he refused, had been refusing to eat anything but Cheerios with no milk for breakfast. Yeah, horrifying. Uh -huh. And you, can see why, you could see why his mom, Nicole, was anxious to get him some nutrition. So for weeks, Nicole had been trying uh, to get vitamins, liquid vitamins, down, his, uh, down him, down him, <laughs> to ha have him take li liquid vitamins through a dropper, and he was, he was holding the line pretty firmly. But on that morning, on that morning, she succeeded. And she felt good about it, and no doubt he felt good about it. It was a breakthrough. There, there's something that happened towards the end that is too heartbreaking to read. 
and I'm sorry, I just don't think I can read it. <laughs> uh, Noah, this is Noah two days, this is on Wednesday. Uh, Noah was lighting the candles for, for the Jewish holidays. And he was, he was excited about it. That's like a rite of passage for anybody to hold a candle that's actually on fire. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a, a photo taken by his dad, uh, Lenny. Uh, his, his, Lenny and Veronique, his mother, were separated but co-parenting. And when, this was on a Wednesday, and when, when Veronique, okay, when Veronique went to the house to, um, to deliver some food and other things for Noah, uh, he, he brought her right over to the candles, and he said, guess what I did? Guess what I did? I lit the candles. And he was so proud. And the next day, then uh, Veronique left. It's the last time she saw him. The next day on the way, Noah has a twin sister who was also at the Sandy Hook School and also an older sister, Sophia. And the next day, uh, uh, it was Lenny's turn to drive them to the Sandy Hook. And it was about a 20-minute drive. And they, the, the whole drive, uh, they had Len in the front seat. They had three really small kids in the back. Noah, his twin sister, is older sister who was really only eight, but she was technically older. And they were, they were blasting Gangnam Style, which was a song that was very popular at the time. It was like a viral song. And every time this song ended, the kids would scream, you know, play it again, play it again. And, and Len remembers very vividly the excitement and sort of uh, uh, disorganization of Noah bounding out on his way to school. A kid, he's got a, he, he, he describes him as having a backpack on one shoulder. His, his coat was draped kind of sloppily over the other. And he was sort of a hot mess at the time. Uh, and uh, that was his memory of dropping off, off Noah. And then there is Daniel Barden. What can I say about Daniel Barden? Uh, I mean, I, that, that, that picture doesn't say, so I'm going to not, next uh, person. <laughs> uh, Daniel was an uh, a, a energetic, uh, creative, um, social, and lovely child, and I never even met him. <laughs> but but, but on, the, on this morning, uh, it was, again, the, the, there, were, there were little things that happened this morning that were a little different for, for everybody, but on this morning, uh, Daniel got up super early, and he trailed his uh, older brother, who he admired, um, out the door and was sort of like shuffling. Uh, and by the way, his older brother's name is James. Uh, and, and, he, and he followed James down the driveway, his little flip-flops and his pajamas. And they, they heard a pitter-patter, and, and, and Mark was with James. They turned around and said, Daniel, what are you doing up? <laughs> uh, and, then, and then Mark, who's a musician, sat down with Daniel and, uh, and, try, and started teaching him jingle bells. Daniel had written, had, had, Daniel was pretty, I don't know if this is unusual for him, but he was very uh, prepared for the holidays. He had written Santa a letter. And I'll just read it to you. It's not long. It said, Dear Santa, I just hope you can let me see you with your reindeer. Merry Christmas. And they added, please write back. (laughs) I love you, Daniel. Ah. This is Ben. This is not, this, this is not funny. This is not funny. This problem we have is just not funny. This is Dan- Benjamin Wheeler. There is a, things were a little hectic in the Wheeler household. Apparently, uh, Francine, Benjamin's mom, had ta- had, uh, and David, Francine's dad, had swapped cars the day before because, uh, I don't want to get into a marital issue here, spat, but basically, <laughs> basically, uh, it, let's, let's move on. But basically, uh, but basically, uh, David was frantically trying to go to work. He, got into, he couldn't find his keys, so he got into Francine's car, and he drove off. Unbeknown to David was uh, Benjamin's backpack in the, in the back seat. And any parent knows that when a kid can't find his backpack, there is no worse thing that can happen. Uh, and so um, Francine, um, Benjamin's mother, sprung to action with her wonderful instincts and lovable 
and lovely instincts, and, and she knew she had to cheer up uh, Benjamin. So after they dropped off Benjamin's idol and older brother, Nate, at school, uh, <laughs> Francine offered Benjamin what was, in my mind, a pretty obvious choice. Benjamin, you could either go home and wait for the bus, or you can go to, come to star- Starbucks with me and get some hot chocolate. <laughs> That's the uh, essence of a no-brainer for a 60-year-old. And, uh, and so they were sitting at, at Starbucks, and uh, Francine, Benjamin sort of calmed down, and, and, and all of a sudden Benjamin said, um, do you know what I'm going to be when I grow up? An architect. And then he kept talking, as he was wont to do, and said, but I might also want to be a paleontologist like Nate wants to be. <laughs> And Francine looked at Benjamin, and you know, she said, you know, Benjamin, you don't always have to do what Nate does. And uh, of course, Benjamin said, wrong, basically. I'm always going to be with Nate. I love Nate, and I love you. And then Francine was I'm sure warm, warmed her heart. She said, I love you too. And then Ben said, can I borrow your iPhone? <laughs> such, a, such a kid thing to do, isn't it? He wanted to play a game on the iPhone. And after Starbucks, they, Francine drove Benjamin to the school, and her last words to him were, close the door. Um, in, in about five minutes, an AR-15, a combat weapon, This is the AR-15 on the floor of the first grand classroom. Was used not by a highly trained soldier, but by a deeply troubled kid. Not on a battlefield abroad, but in an elementary school at home. And not to preserve freedoms, but to eviscerate them. When I first, we can take this out. When I first, uh, when we first looked into the case, we again, we thought it was really about the gun. And it is, the gun is a, a big, it has a role here. But there was a chilling part to what we learned that was comparable to this. And that was about greed. It was about greed. We always thought the I thought the the case was really about the gun, but it's just as much about greed. Once the AR-15 was adopted by the military, it was available to the civilian population. For decades, you could get an AR-15. For decades. But it was not... But the market was kind of small. It was a very niche market. Why was the market small for an AR-15? Because nobody really felt they wanted one or needed one. Nobody had their identity caught up in whether they held an AR-15. Nobody was so fragile that they needed an AR-15 combat weapon to prove something. And a lot of people just didn't know enough or care enough to see if they could get one. However, there was a market, a market of responsible people, a market of specialists, a market of people who knew what an AR-15 was and knew what the responsibility was of owning an AR-15. These were people maybe like target hunters or, uh, you know, people on gun ranges, those kinds of things. For about 40 years, the market was small. In fact, Remington, which is an iconic American company, which, we, which I can, pr- with some pride, real pride, talking about old Remington now, uh, can say has deep roots here in Connecticut. There's a, there's a Remington factory in Bridgeport that, uh, that was very integral in the Remington brand. And for decades, Remington didn't sell an AR-15. In fact, When the DuPonts owned Remington, they didn't even sell handguns. They were content 
to carry on the tradition, the proud tradition of the, the country, which is very much part of who we are, of hunting, right? So they, the, 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 uh, the Remington was all about that tradition, safety. And they were, of course they were interested in profit. But you know what they cared about just as much as uh, as profit? They cared about people. Starting with their own people, their employees. They were good to their employees. They wouldn't fire somebody who had been working there for 30 years simply because that person had a big salary and was starting to lose efficiency. And they were responsible. Remington was a very responsible company. What Remington proved is that you can be in the gun industry and be profitable, and also be responsible. That's what they proved in almost 200 years until they were taken over by Cerberus, which is a a private equity firm in midtown Manhattan. Greed kills. When Cerberus, Cerberus, the, the idea of private equity money going into the gun industry was novel, was creative, and turned out to be, for a while anyway, extremely successful. Extremely successful. It was, it was if you could take away everything else about it, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. The minds at this private equity firm looked at the landscape of the gun industry. And they didn't see big Fortune 500 company here, big Fortune 500 company there. This wasn't the oil industry where you have my, my friend, I have somebody who knows more about this, but like that you have like all these different publicly traded companies. These were all small, privately owned niche companies, some of which were like Remington built from the ground up by somebody who had skin in the game, who was proud of their product and good to their workers and responsible. People like uh, the Bushmaster founder, Richard Dyke, who, uh, who had built Bush- Bushmaster. And Bushmaster was a company that was selling and, specializes, and specialized in AR-15s. Um, they were one of five or six companies, small companies that made AR-15s at the time that this private equity firm got involved. And what private equity does, for those of you who didn't know, I didn't know I was gonna be, it's gonna be a lesson in private equity and guns and gun, I mean it was, but, but you go where the, the evidence takes you. And what private equity does is they look for these opportunities to take all these small little component parts and they roll them up, right? So instead of having five marketing departments, that you have one. Instead of having five manufacturing plants, you have one. Uh, You know, the obvious uh, implications of that is you could do more with less and more effectively and spend less. Um, And that's what they did. And they had, and the private equity firm, unlike Remington and Sons, which was built to provide value and something built by hand, uh, like, and built in America, actually, also the, their, their hunting rifles, uh, and was passed on in the family and, to, and the people who were treated like family. The private equity uh, 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 goal here was unabashedly, there was only one goal. Let's turn this gun, let's, let's, make, let's build a gun cl- conglomerate and turn it into a, a billion dollar a year massive behemoth gun industry, gun company. And that was pretty much unheard of. Even, even the publicly traded companies uh, were probably not the size of that, that, uh, that goal was uh, set to meet. Um, and when you're building a market, uh, uh, marketing was also a big part of this case. We're, we're moving on, in essence, from, from the gun to, to these other principles of, of fair dealing, these principles of responsibility. Uh, and, and, and while you could say uh, that some gun companies don't have, with some argument that the gun companies uh, don't show a lot of responsibility, what about the private equity firms that, that, take, uh, that take homegrown operations and, and, and they strip them of all their personality in the effort to, to make money. And so when these two things collided with Cerberus in 
uh, 2000, about, in about 2005, roughly, when this was all brewing, there were about 100,000 AR-15s sold uh, in America. In 2012, the year of the Sandy Hook, there were over 2 million. There were over 2 million. What an incredible accomplishment. How do you take, I mean, first of all, it, it's hard enough to make a new product and tell people they need it, they should want it, that they are not, that there's some, some attraction to it that's going to cause them to want the weapon, in this case, a weapon. But how do you take a, a, a product that's just been sitting there and do that? That is, that's masterful. That's masterful. Uh, and they did it in a very smart way. Uh, they, they, first, they knew they had a built-in customer base of gun owners because gun owners are whatever the stat is, 40% of people own guns, something like that. Don't quote me on that. But they had an established customer base. But obviously, those customers hadn't, hadn't been enticed to buy an AR-15 because their natural instincts would be, why do I need that? I've got my hunting rifle. I've got my home defense you know, a gun or, or, or shotgun. You know, I don't need some, uh, I'm, I don't need to play military in my neighborhood. Why do I need that? So that was uh, one of their target. But, but if you could convince them to buy one, what a boon that would be, considering just do the numbers. It's all math. Uh, and then their second goal was to try to find a market that had not been exposed to guns yet. Not the older established uh, gun purchaser, but a new market of young, uh, young people who had never owned a weapon. They call this in, in marketing, targeting an end user. Targeting an end user. This is what I learned. And when you, and targeting an end user, somebody explained it to me like this. Our kids probably, if you have kids, somewhere along the lines, they were interested, they, they liked, we wanted something from the Disney Corporation. The Disney Corporation is not targeting us, right? They're targeting our kids. We are the purchaser, but we're just the vessel that delivers the money to Disney. We are being pushed by our kids, and we want to do our kids, well, we try, within some moderation, but you get the picture. They target the end user, and they were very specific about targeting this market. And because, and, and to, to how do you target people who have never owned a weapon? You have to do this, you have to convince them they need it. The younger male demographic tap into their anxieties about masculinity. masculinity. Tap into their uh, feelings of aggrievement or in, in, uh, uh, insecurity. Uh, Maybe, it's a, maybe you're tapping into their uh, lack of being physically strong. Tell them that this weapon conveys power and masculinity. You bet, you know what, if somebody had offered me something that conveyed power and masculinity, even today I would take it. <laughs> but back then, I would definitely take it. I would take that in a heartbeat. I would take it in a heartbeat. And I bet you all know people like this who would grab that opportunity And they did it um, in many different ways. Very clever, very orchestrated. Um, so let's show the old Bushmaster. First of all, they had rolled up Bushmaster. One of the problems is they had four companies that were all selling AR-15s. Uh, or three of them were. So anyway, this is an old-fashioned Bushmaster marketing. Now... If a troubled young person who probably shouldn't have a weapon in their hands looks at this, no problem. This ain't a sale, right? But what about the responsible gun owner that we always hear about, that apparently is the iconic gun owner that the industry is seeking? Well, the responsible gun owner could say, I want an AR-15, look at these specifications, and they, this is how the engagement happened, right? This is Bushmaster before the acquisition. Uh, and this is not going to 
this is going to be, you're not going to get the off the, off the uh, chart sales that they were looking for to make their billion dollars. But you are going to get a customer who has a desire, a natural desire for a weapon and has the inclination to get it. Next. Here's what they did uh, to one of the things they did, you know, because they were capitalizing on the ability to reach directly around the parents into the bedrooms of children and teenagers and young adults. And they knew it. They knew it. The, we, have, we know they know it. We know they know it. And all they were really doing, in fairness, was using the modern means of communication to reach a target audience. So these are just examples of banners they used. Jeff stayed at home to watch Mamma Mia with his fiance instead of coming to poker night with the boys. And Jeff is a crier. And what they would do with this particular man card campaign is you could also, we don't have, I don't think we have it on, on here, but you could also report somebody. So if somebody was not a, um, if somebody was not a, uh, you know, you know uh, a man, you could turn in your friends and say this, and then you would, you would enter their email addresses, and no doubt, no doubt you would get a, uh, that you would get, uh, you'd plot their email, and then you would be delivering to Bushmaster, which was one of the brands of this conglomeration that became Remington. You would, that, they would have your, that person's email in it for marketing purposes. You could report your friend for not being a man, because they don't own a book, and, 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 and Bushmaster wanted to know that because now they're like, okay, think about that for a second. You've been reported by your friend. You don't, maybe you're not a, somebody who would normally want to be interested in a weapon like this, but your friend has just turned you in. He thinks you're a wimp. And he, you see, the, you see the, your lifeline to masculinity. It was actually really smart, wasn't it? It was really smart. Take away everything else. It was really smart. All right. And then everybody's seen this. Uh, this is with the payoff that you, that you would get. And the, the, it's a good thing all these families are sitting down. Uh, the, uh, the, the thing is that, that, that Cerberus, uh, you know, who is sort of the oversight, but it was really through a, a holding company called Freedom Group, which became Remington. Forget to ever, unnecessary complications. <laughs> but what they did was they, uh, they were so successful at, 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 sort of raising this product from the ashes, and the sales were going through the roof. And what happens when, it's like when you see the stock, you, when somebody sees a stock going up, they want to be part of it, they want to rush in, right? And that's exactly what happened. All of their competitors were saying, hey, you know that dusty old AR-15 that nobody wanted? It's a cash cow. It's a cash cow. And we know this, we know this, because you can see it in the sales charts. Because this is an industry that tracks what each other's doing, like no other industry. Everybody knows everybody else's business. And they sort of look over. And so, for example, Smith & Wesson, seeing this explosion in sales, which, which was also very much the product of, of the stoking of the fear of President Obama taking everybody's guns. Uh, Smith & Wesson, which was one of, their, one of the competitors of this gun conglomerate, who had also never sold an AR-15, uh, got into the AR-15 game. And uh, just, just, I think it's appropriate to say, and we all know that the Smith & Wesson product was used, an AR-15, by another troubled young man in, in Parkland. Uh, and uh, it is likely that Smith & Wesson never would have made an AR-15 to market to kids or young, let's call it young adults like this, had uh, this uh, effort not been so successful. But think about what happens, the basic supply and demand. Think about what happens now. Everybody's rushing in. There had been about, about six or seven before Cerberus started, companies that were making AR-15s before, all very small. By 2009 and 10, there were like 31 companies making AR-15s. Now, what happens when you have this onslaught of supply and the president that you were saying was going to take away everybody's guns doesn't. Then you have a problem with demand. And how do you start out, now that all these players have rushed in, by distinguishing your product, your brand, from, from the others? Marketing. 
marketing. It's the only way. You know why? All AR-15s function the same. They all function the same. I'm sure you get somebody to say, oh, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This one has this thing. They are all functionally equivalent. So the only way to distinguish it is with marketing and branding. And with the intense competition, they had to take that next step. They had to cash in on their, Bushmaster in particular was the brand associated with uh, things that are not legal, for example, like combat, you know, for civilians, you can't, combat is not a legal thing, thing to engage in with a AR-15 in, in our streets and neighborhoods, uh, assaultive kind of things, and these, all these slogans. And, and they will tell you this is made for hunting, but where's the, where's the animal? Where's the animal in this? They will tell you it's made for target shooting. Really? Uh, they will tell you it has uh, all these different things that it doesn't have, and that's why nobody bought this product except for a small niche of people, because they knew what the weapon was for, and they, whatever that purpose was. It wasn't any of those things. And, uh, but to distinguish, they, they, so what they did was they, again, another brilliant idea, they started, they started a, a sister kind of product called the Adaptive Combat Rifle. And, they, and they, to distinguish the Bushmaster brand. And if you're going to buy, there's cross, branding is important because if I'm going to buy, to use our friend Dylan's favorite cereals, Cheerios, I, and there's a Honey Nut Cheerios, I'm in, right? So the Honey Nut Cheerios branding is working on me to buy Cheerios. The regular Cheerios is cross-branding. So the Bushmaster brand was carving out this niche market. And so here's, they upped the, they upped the ante. So that's another, that's another Bushmaster uh, ad. I will just point out that's a lone gunman. That's a lone gunman. And this is, you know, and so getting this type of thing out to the commercial market is just, there's, there, it's, it's, there's no, it just is what it is. You can see it. It's in plain sight. And, uh, uh, and this is what, in furtherance of their branding. So, but when they, to distinguish themselves on the ACR, they went the next level. First of all, they developed something. First of all, it's called an adaptive combat rifle. To, to, to your friends and neighbors, they will sell you an adaptive combat rifle. Just stop right there and think about that. First of all, why would they... And, and look, at, look at the messaging. Clear the room, cover the rooftop, rescue the hostage. Do I need, even need to put out the man card that is conferred, they're not selling, this is not marketing to the military. The military doesn't need man cards. <laughs> they, don't need to, they don't need man cards. And the executives at, at this organization would refer to the people who they were targeting in, with Bushmaster and their sister DPMS as wannabes. And if you think about the implications of clearing the room I mean, what, what, what message could they possibly sending that is lawful? What message? Forces of opposition bow down. You have been single-handedly outnumbered. It is true that during this marketing and this effort to make a billion dollars, largely on the backs of the AR-15 and, and, and military combat we weapons, there had not been as many... Uh, in school shootings, of course, as there are, are today. However, was, wasn't everybody around at Columbine? Wasn't everybody around at Virginia Tech? Why would you make a weapon to have people force oppositions down, bow down if that could happen? And why would you market it to the target audience they were marketing it to if you were a responsible company, let alone in... Uh, Remington never did this with their hunting rifles. And this is a little bit of the, I would say it's the sort of the pièce de resist, what was that for? Pièce de resistance? The, 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 Remington got really lucky having developed an association with Activision in the enormously successful Call of Duty franchise. Um, and this was one of those modern ways to market a weapon to circumvent the traditional barriers of children uh, that you would have with children because, uh, you know, children aren't going to march into a gun store and, re and order a gun magazine, right? And teenagers, I would say. But, but this is a way to reach underage people as well as lawfully aged people. 
with marketing, and it's so effective. It's so, so, so effective. And actually, there were naysayers at Remington who said, I don't know. They were amazed. They were amazed at how lifelike this was. And, and there was one comment that was made was, you know, we used to have to get people out to the gun range to show that our weapons had little, little recoil. You don't need to do that anymore. And when a 12-year-old made a replica of a functioning ACR, this is... Uh, anyway, when a family... This is my hook, I guess, I'm getting. But when the... When the uh, when everybody's like, yay. Uh, but, but when the families... When the, they saw the pay dirt. Uh, they saw the pay dirt in this. And... Uh, and they feature, uh, they feature, of course, this, this, there's no controlling who, what message this reaches. And they understood that people who playing the game who would experience this rifle would look, would then go online to look at the product. And they, that's by their own uh, admission, essentially. Okay. Um, so uh, why, if, if, so that's, that's, that's enough of a background, but so many we, we hear about these things, and we think of them out theoretically, like what is the weapon, what is the market have to do it. It really doesn't, until you see the whole picture, for me at least, it didn't really add up. And that's when I realized that we had a problem with greed and irresponsibility going all around in this case. Um, if, there, if this wasn't the gun industry, but any, uh, literally any other industry, nobody would have sort of batted an eyelash when we filed this lawsuit on behalf of these wonderful families. Uh, nobody, because you would have said, of course, there's, of course the people who were pushing this should be held accountable, or at least you, of course you should have the right to investigate and look into whether, you know, the conduct, as, as we all do. This is the great equalizer. Um, and I was thinking, yeah, of course, and then I, Somebody pointed out to me that there was actually a law that was different for the gun industry than anybody else. So I, after finally feeling some comfort about, you know, I'm talking to me and my, all my colleagues because this is, a, if ever there was a team effort, it's, it's been this one, but uh, that we had a, le a legal problem here, that, there was, that, that we're, we're practicing lawyers have been around for a while. We were practicing in 2005. None of us had ever heard of this law. Uh, but apparently in 2005, the NRA, NRA went to Congress and basically asked Congress for a favor. They said they wanted protections where people were injured or killed by their guns, even if, they, even if the, the, the industry or the company did something wrong. They wanted special protections. And of course, our whole judicial system has developed over a long period of time to create a balance between the rights of individuals and the rights of companies, as it should be, and, there's a night, and it's worked out, right? So we all know that this is important to hold corporations accountable, and that also creates better conduct. And when, asked, when, they, when, when Congress was asked to choose between the ordinary rights of families have to pursue just cases and hold industries accountable on the one hand and the bottom line of the gun industry on the other, Congress, which could have said no, they could have said let the regular rules apply, Congress put its thumb on the bottom line of the gun industry. And of course that made the industry very happy, but it did something worse. It gave the industry a perception that nothing they did could ever be uh, evaluated, nothing that they did could ever be subject to scrutiny, nothing they did could ever lead to liability. And that made uh, gun companies a very nice, tidy uh, uh, partnership for insurance companies. What's better for an insurance company than collecting a premium that you don't think you have to pay out on? And what is more dangerous than any industry believing that they can do whatever they want if profit is the only motive? That they have no skin in the game, no responsibility to families of people injured. They don't, the laws don't apply to them. And that perception, I think, is the worst thing about PLACA that, that was done. There, we met some really good people who were in the gun industry. I liked them. I saw fathers and grandfathers, even 
the executives that I would be prone not, you know, whatever, I would have had a, a sort of a, a hesitancy. I saw human beings. But when human beings are gathered together simply to make profit, and they don't believe that they can be held responsible for anything, bad things happen. 